Good afternoon and welcome to the Nag Memorial Endowment Lecture for 2015. The series of Nag Memorial Lectures was instituted in IMSE in 2002 in the memory of late Professor Subhashish Nag of IMSE and it's supported by a generous contribution of his widow, Mrs. Sutapa Nag. And the aim is to promote research in mathematical sciences by inviting eminent mathematical scientists annually for a lecture series at IMSC, one of which is a public lecture, as is today's talk. This year, the speaker is Professor Shiraz Menwala from TIFR, Mumbai. And I request Sujay Ashok to formally introduce the speaker. I'd like to welcome you all, uh, having braved the weather. Um, very pleased and honored to welcome Shiraz Minwala to give this Nag Memorial Lecture. He's one of the leading figures in the research of string theory, not only in India, but also worldwide. Uh, he obtained his PhD from Princeton University, working with Professor Nathan Seiberg. After his PhD, he was a Harvard Junior Fellow and subsequently an assistant professor at Harvard. He's currently a professor of theoretical physics at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Mumbai. So he's left an impact on a variety of fields within string theory such as non-commutative quantum field theory, uh, supersymmetric gauge theories in various dimensions, but especially in the field of ADS-CFT correspondence, which is also the subject of his talk today. One of his best known works uh, is the formulation of the fluid gravity correspondence, in which he showed that uh, there was a clear connection between the equations of fluid dynamics and Einstein's equations of relativity. He was awarded the 2014 New Horizons in Physics Prize for this work. He's also the recipient of the ICTP Prize, the Patnagar Prize for Science and Technology, which is the highest science award in India, and also the Infosys Prize. So he has already given us a, a series of lectures on his latest work on an effective theory of dynamical horizons, which uh, we hope would greatly contribute to our understanding of the dynamics of black holes. We're very grateful that uh, he could spend a whole week with us. And without further delay, I'd like to welcome Shiraz to give the Nag Memorial Lecture. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I, it's been a great week at, uh, at Math Science. I'm very, I've, I've been very happy to be here. OK. Um, my talk today is titled String Theory and the Gauge Gravity Correspondence. And this is what I'm going to try, tell you about. I'm going to tell you about the problem. You know, you, string theory is, is an attempt to build a framework for understanding quantum theories of gravity. And uh, um, so in order to introduce you to the research in string theory and its, its accomplishments, I will first describe the problem of quantum gravity. What is the issue? Why do we want a quantum theory of gravity? And why is it a difficult thing to do? OK. I will then give you a brief introduction to the framework of string theory, which has had some success in producing uh, in going towards the goal of producing consistent quantum theories of gravity. And then the central part of the talk will be to describe a particular model um, which, at least in my opinion, in a completely satisfactory way solves the problem of giving one example of a consistent quantum theory of gravity. It's a very surprising model. The solution to the quantization of gravity in this model is very, has a very surprising answer. I will try to explain that answer to you, explain why uh, it's surprising. Uh, I'll then uh, talk about future outlook and end with some conclusions. OK, so quantum gravity. Theoretical physicists have, over the last two, three hundred years, um, developed increasingly sophisticated uh, mathematical models that now describe a huge variety of physical phenomena. OK. What's really striking about the study of physics, one of the things that's really striking about the study of physics is the economy and unity, economy of concepts that go into the study, and the unity of the ideas 
um, that you see across various fields of study of physics. Almost all our incredibly successful models of uh, uh, theoretical physics, which describe wide ranges of phenomena, um, are underlain by a few theoretic, basic theoretical frameworks. Okay? A handful of basic theoretical frameworks, and what I mean by theoretical framework is a fundamental mathematical and interpretive structure underlie almost all of the, all of the models, uh, very successful, pheno phenomenologically very successful models of theoretical physics. My talk today will uh, talk about two of these frameworks and the interconnection between them. Okay? The first framework, the one that will, uh, uh, has to, is about, uh, you know, re refers to the first term in quantum gravity. It's the quantum framework. The quantum framework developed bet, bet, uh, in the early past of, uh, part of the last century is the basic framework, the basic grammar in which uh, all of the laws of, for instance, particle physics have been written over the last century. Okay? Uh, theories of particle physics, theories that try to describe elementary interactions, the interactions of elementary objects, are written within the framework of a quantum theory. Okay, let's say this in a little more detail. In a little more detail, theories of elementary particle physics are set within the framework of quantum field theory. So, let me give you a two minute introduction to the basic idea of quantum field theory. Quantum field theories are theories set within space time. In these theories, space time forms a non dynamical stage. You know, it's, it hosts dynamics but is not affected by dynamics. Okay? It's a non-dynamical stage on which a dynamics happens. Each point in space-time hosts one or a few, a finite number of degrees of freedom. These degrees of freedom are quantum. Okay? These degrees of freedom undergo their dynamics interacting with each other, but in a local way. Degrees of freedom here interact with degrees of freedom only nearby, directly. All interactions between things here and things there happen, happen through intermediate propagation uh, with other degrees of freedom. Okay? So quantum field theories have this basic structure. Uh, they're quantum theories. Space-time is non-dynamical. It's a stage for that uh, on which the dynamics happens. And interactions are local. Okay? That's all we're going to need to know about quantum field theories today, for those who, who don't already know all about them. Now, quantum field, you know, the, the quantum mechanics is a framework. Quantum field theories also form another framework. Within the framework of quantum field theories, you can write down an infinite number of different models to describe different kinds of physics. There's a particular quantum field theory which has a name. It's called the standard model of particle physics. This particular quantum field theory has been spectacularly successful in describing the elementary constituents of the, of the world so far as we have been able to uh, probe them and describing the interactions of these constituents. Okay? Uh, this, this table here uh, lists uh, some of the particles in the standard model of particle physics, the quarks, the neutrinos, the electrons, muons, tau. Each of these particles, is a, uh, the bosons, okay, uh, the force-carrying bosons, the Higgs boson, which has just been found two or three years ago. Okay, uh, it, it lists the various particles in the standard model of physics. Each of these particles is associated with, with a field, a quantum field, associated with each field that are degrees of freedom at each point in space-time, interacting in the manner that I told you about in the last transparency. Okay. So this is the framework within which particle physics is usually studied, the framework of quantum field theory. Great. That's all I'm going to say about quantum field theory in this round. Now, there is a second framework that has been of great utility in the study and the description of a completely different kind of, kind of physics, uh, the physics of cosmology. So cosmology is that branch of physics that tries to describe the dynamics of the universe as a whole. How did the universe begin? How has it evolved since it began? Where, where is it going to? Okay. So in contrast, the mod, mo, modern theories of cosmology, in contrast to theories of particle physics, 
Modern theories of cosmology are set within the framework, uh, within another framework, the framework of classical general relativity. This was the theory invented by Einstein about 100 years ago. And in this theory, as opposed to in quantum field theories, space and time are not passive background stages for dynamics, they're participants in dynamics. Okay? Um, the geometry of space time evolves dynamically, is one of the participants, one of the players of dynamics. Okay? In this theory, each point in space hosts a set of classical degrees of freedom with interact locally with each other as well as these classical degrees of freedom are degrees of freedom associated with matter fields. For instance, the electromagnetic field or the, the fields associated with the particles we talked about uh, some, uh, in the previous slide, inappropriate classical limits, okay, uh, which interact locally with each other as well as with the dynamically evolving geometry of space and time. So there are two basic differences. There are two basic differences between uh, the framework of quantum field theory, the two key differences, uh, and, the, and the framework of general relativity. The first key difference is that space-time is passive, unmoving, unchanged, it's just a, a host, a stage for dynamics in quantum field theory. It's a participant in dynamics in the theory of relativity. The second difference is that um, in quantum field theories, all dynamics is quantum, whereas in general relativity, all dynamics is classical. Okay? So each of these two frameworks has an element that the other one doesn't have. General relativity has an element which is a true feature of the real world. Space-time is dynamical. Quantum field theories have an element which is a true feature of the real world. In dynamics, true dynamics is quantum. Okay? So each has one plus and one, one minus. Now, the general relativity-based model of cosmology has proved extremely successful in modeling the universe over time scales of billions of years and over distant scales of billions of light years. General relativity also successfully models terrestrial scale phenomena. Uh, for instance, it's famous that uh, general relativity predicted time, di di time dilations go into accurate programming of GPSs um, and into you know, various other terrestrial scale, scale phenomena. So general relativity has had great successes over many decades of uh, time scales of distance scales, uh, very success, is a very successful framework for modeling, in particular for modeling cosmology. On the other hand, as we've already said, quantum field theory, the framework of quantum the field theory, and the particular quantum field theory of the standard model, has been remarkably successful in de describing subatomic scale physics. You know, quantum, the quantum field theory model of particle physics allows you to predict some things to create, by theoretically predict some quantities like uh, the anomalous magnetic moment of the electron to some crazy number of decimals. I can't even remember, 13 or 14, something like that. Experiment, uh, these, this quantity has been measured to the same number of decimals, and decimal by decimal, it all agrees. It's a very remarkable, very successful framework for making predictions that have been verified. On the other hand, the general theory of relativity has been spectacularly successful in describing astrophysical and cosmological dynamics from scales ranging from kilometers to the size of the universe. However, neither framework is completely satisfactory. Quantum field theories are unsatisfactory because they ignore, or they appear to ignore, an experimentally true fact about the real world, namely that the geometry of space-time is dynamical. So they make an approximation. Okay? Uh, on the other hand, general relativity ignores the experimentally true fact that True dynamics of things is classical only in some approximation. True dynamics is quantum. Okay? Hence, neither framework that we talked about seems appropriate for modeling phenomena that would be uh, dominated by, fluctu by quantum fluctuations of a dynamical spacetime. So, if there's some phenomenon in which it's important both that spacetime is dynamical as well as that it's quantum, neither framework works for it. Okay? Now, you could ask, well, is there a phenomenon like this that might be of interest to us? And we don't know for sure, but plausibly the answer is yes. Plausibly the answer is that there was an event, okay, of great interest to any thinking human being, 
uh, which, in order to describe which, we need to have a quantum theory of gravity. And that event uh, uh, we could crudely call the birth of the universe. Let me take you th through, that, uh, uh, through that comment in a little more detail. You see, the general relativity-based model of cosmology um, predicts, you know, like any theory of phys physics, it starts with what you know at one time and predicts the future. But like all theories of physics, um, the models that can predict the future can also predict the past. So we can use general relativity, the general relativity-based model of cosmology, to study the history of the universe. The idea behind the study is you look to see what the universe looks like today. That sets an initial condition for your equations. Then you evolve the equations back in time using the general relativity-based model of cosmology to predict what the universe would have looked like at an earlier point in time. Oops. Okay. So the general relativity-based model of cosmology has been used to run the history of the universe backwards from its current observed state. This process, you know, at the moment what we see is that all the galaxies are moving away from us. When you reverse, you go back in time, you see the galaxies. If you imagine making a movie of what happens, you see the galaxies all coming nearer, 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 nearer to each other. And then it takes you to an interesting epoch, uh, about 13.7 billion years ago, in which the universe became, has, appears to have become extremely small, which is really highly curved, uh, and dense. Okay? Now things really start getting interesting. We take this big, huge universe with the galaxies moving away. You go back, way, way, way back in time, you get a very small and dense universe. And now you want to know what happened before then. And though we're not quite sure, uh, the answer is really that we don't know. The reason that we don't know, one of the reasons that we don't know is that, you see, in order to evolve the movie further back, so the movie is being run by the equations of physics. And in order to evolve the movie further back, you need to know the correct equations of physics that apply to this very, very dense and small universe. Okay? And we don't know whether we know the right equations of physics to do. Well, we think we don't know the right equations of physics to, to do that evolution backwards. And in particular, it's very plausible that the correct equations of physics that are needed to evolve that movie further back to answer the question, what, what happened you know, just bef before it was this very small, dense thing? are equations in which the universe was both quantum as well as gravitational. Okay? If that's the case, we're sunk because with the, 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 the frameworks that we have, namely that of general relativity and that of quantum field theory, we do not have a framework that can accurately describe quantum fluctuating geometries. Okay? Now, a fascinating proposal for what uh, what happened actually before uh, this? Uh, um, uh, uh, what, what, what happened in the very early universe is provided by uh, the theory of inflation, and uh, um, uh, a fascinating proposal for what happened before is provided by the theory of inflation, um, which I will not describe in detail to, for, for, to you now, but. Um, uh, one of which, whose proposals is the fact, is, is a claim that the origin of all structure in the universe today, uh, all structure in the universe today has its basic origins in quantum fluctuations of a very, uh, an almost homogeneous, almost translationally um, invariant phase um, in the very early universe. So this is the kind of, you know, in order to know what happened before this very hot, dense phase, we need to know new physics. One possible proposal for what, what this new physics is, is this theory of inflation. Um, what happened before inflation, if, that, if, there's a good, if that's a good question to ask? You know, all of this requires us to know new physics, and it's very, it seems very plausible that in order to complete the cycle, uh, we will need a framework which, need, which can successfully describe both uh, 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 physics which has dynamics that is both gravitational as well as quantum. Okay, so plausibly in order to address a question that is of great interest to all of us in this room and I think to most, many people who, 
to many children who think about such things, you know, how did it all begin? We need a quantum theory of gravity. Okay, I'll skip. I had a discussion of the bicep experiment, which we can get to later on. If, uh, uh, and so let's get back to the main, main line. Okay, so hopefully we're all now very motivated. We understand that we have this framework of quantum gravity, oh, sorry, of uh, uh, quantum field theory. We have a framework of gen general relativity based framework of cosmology. Both of these have lacunae. We don't have a framework which fills in these lacunae. Uh, uh, I mean, we need a framework that fills in these lacunae. And uh, we need it not just for intellectual satisfaction, but plausibly in order to address the question of how did it all begin? Which is clearly an interesting question to be able to address. Okay, so, you know, this, the fact that we need a quantum theory of gravity has been apparent to some people for almost 100 years. I think Dirac, the famous physicist Dirac, began his search for a quantum theory of gravity by, the 1930, by 1930, I think, you know, very soon after the invention of quantum mechanics. Uh, he was already interested in trying to understand quantum gravity. This is an obvious question. Okay? So, why haven't we already found it? Why haven't we already found the theory of quantum gravity with all these very smart people working on this problem for so many years? There's an unfortunate circumstance that hampers the search for a quantum theory of gravity. And this, uh, this unfortunate circumstance is the following. You see, quantum fluctuations of space-time geometry are important only at very small length scales, apparently at a length scale called the Planck scale, which is about 10 to the power minus 34 centimeters. And um, you know, it's a basic rule of collider physics. Uh, we tend to do particle physics in these things called colliders. We take a particle and another particle, bang them together very hard. Great, very high energies to try, try to see uh, what comes out. It's a basic rule of collider physics that the distance scales you can probe go inversely with the energies that you have to put in. So in order to kind of to try to probe the distance scales at which quantum fluctuations of space-time will become important in collider-based experiments, you'd have to go to very, very high energies, much higher than the kinds of energies we've been able to achieve today in collider-based experiments. Okay, so no collider experiment yet constructed or foreseen is directly sensitive to fluctuations at this very small length scale. So, a key, uh, you know, a key uh, uh, element in the armory of a physicist trying to find a new theory, namely a rich set of experimental data, is absent in the study of quantum gravity. This is the basic problem in the, stu in the study of this theory. We have very little input from experiment. Now, you might think that, well, I've already told you that uh, quantum gravity might well have been important in the very early universe. So you might think, well, why, why are you so obsessed by, by colliders? How about figuring out things that quantum gravity would have done in the very early universe, then using the equations of physics to evolve that forward over 13.6 billion years, Measuring what you can now and reconstructing experimental results, you know, reconstructing from that what quantum gravity did in the very early universe. Just saying it makes it clear how difficult this program will be. You know, something that happened 13.6, 13.7 billion years ago has to survive all the way to us. Then you have to measure it with enough precision and be able to reconstruct. Clearly, that's a very difficult job. Okay, so. Um, However, it will not be easy to use measurements performed billions of years later to characterize these fluctuations. This experiment that I didn't tell you about, that I can tell you about later, um, of course, its actual results uh, are not about, the, but experiments like this are trying to do something like that, okay, in a very clever way, to try to understand quantum, the simplest quantum fluctuations of, simplest fluctuations of quantum gravitons and their impact on the later universe over 13.6 billion years. But clearly, this is a different, difficult job. And clearly, it will be hard to get a rich data set, uh, the kind that you would get if you could control collider experiments at the, these length scales using such a, use, using this procedure. OK? So perhaps, instead of using colliders, we can try to look for other natural phenomena in the universe in which quantum gravity is important. However, the only other obvious places where quantum gravity is important, like near the singularities of black holes in astrophysical universes um, seem, uh, sorry, astrophysical black holes in the universe seem equally hard to access, okay? 
you can jump into a black hole and maybe probe what's happening quantum mechanically inside, but you'll have a hard time sending the information to your friend outside, unless you're uh, an actor in the movie Gravity. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So you see, this it's, it's like one of these conspiracies, right? Um, all the effects of quantum gravity seem to be shielded from us due to practical limitations. We can't get high enough energies. Where quantum gravity was important in the natural universe was either very long ago or in very in inaccessible places. OK, so what, what, what are the options? Either we should give up, you know, say, well, well, we, we're not good enough to find the quantum theory of gravity, but human beings are not like that. Right? We, we don't give up so easily, thank God. OK. Or you just have to accept that you're constrained to search for a quantum theory of gravity with very lim limited guidance from experiment. Okay? And that is the situation we're in at the moment. Now, I'm going to give you a lightning introduction to what is called the string framework, a framework within which we have managed to produce consistent quantum theories of gravity. Okay, I'll give you a quick introduction to that and then move on to the main part of the talk, namely the description of this one model. Okay. When, when, a, you know, when faced, when, when physicists are faced with a problem uh, like this, like find the theory of quantum gravity in the real world, which seems very difficult because we have so little guidance from experiment, um, one often retreats to trying to address a simpler problem, okay, that has some of the features of this real-world problem. So a problem that uh, uh, was very naturally addressed by physicists was to say, okay, forget about the real world. Can we find any toy model, any toy model in which you have both quantum mechanics and gravity? And it's proved spectacularly that the, the it's proved spectacularly beautifully possible to do this within a particular framework, which is called the framework of string theory. Okay? Uh, look, it's been very difficult to construct even one non trivial mathematically consistent model of quantum fluctuating space times. Uh, the first fully satisfactory, to me, construction of this nature uh, was presented by uh, an Argentinian physicist uh, named Mal, who works in Princeton, uh, named Mal de Sena in 1997. And I'm going to give many more uh, some more details about this below. Maldacena's construction was achieved within the string framework, which I now very briefly review. String theory is an apparently consistent framework for quantum theories of gravity. Much like quantum field theory is a consistent framework for building uh, quantum theories of multiparticle physics. OK? Now, unlike Quantum field theory, certainly unlike quantum mechanics, string theory remains ill understood even in principle. The rules of this framework are understood only in bits and pieces and in special corners. Okay? And in particular, we are very far from a complete classification of all theories that can be constructed within the string framework. So, string theory, at least for practical purposes, I want to emphasize it's badly named theory. Okay, it's not a theory, it's a framework, a little like quantum field theory. Within this framework, at least for practical purposes, within this framework, it's possible to produce many quantum theories of gravity. Just like within quantum field theory, it's possible to produce many non-gravitational non theories of quantum, mecha quantum mechanical theories. Okay? Now, a question when presented with such a framework might be, can you classify all the theories you can, you can make within this framework? The answer with string theory is certainly we, don't, we can't do that. Actually, the similar question even for a, in any in sufficiently interesting class of quantum field theories has not been understood. However, we do understand the structure of a special submanifold of the space of all, all theories in the string, um, in the string framework. This special set already spans a very large variety of quantum theories of gravity. I've drawn a little cartoon of a submanifold of these highly supersymmetric theories, uh, just to have something visually attractive for those of you who don't know string theories. The study of the specially simple subset has already yielded several lessons about gravity, quantum field theory, and geometry. 
However, the rules of string theory are understood very incompletely. Even for most theories in the special set, we are at best able to compute quantities only in an asymptotic expansion in a coupling constant. Okay? And uh, uh, these expansions are non convergent and do not, or at least appear not, yeah, do not, do not, do not uh, constitute an unambiguous definition of the theory. Okay? So, string theory, the string framework, is understood really in bits and pieces. There's a large variety of theories within this framework. Special corners of this framework are understood better than others. In these corners, we can construct many quantities in, an, in, a, in a perturbative expansion to the coupling constant. We know the rules for generating this perturbation series, but we don't know the non-perturbative definition of this theory. In general. OK? So this framework of large number of apparently consistent quantum theories of gravity that we produce within string theory, uh, none of them were 100% satisfactory until, in my opinion, 1997. In, until, in my opinion, in 1997, we didn't have even one example of a 100% well-defined quantum theory of gravity. Okay? However, one such example was discovered in 1997 by Maldasena. Uh, Maldasena discovered in 1997 how in particularly special situations these asymptotic expansions uh, may be completed into a consistent and well-defined theory. And the result was a great surprise. Okay. This is a picture of ADS space which will make an appearance very soon. Okay. So now in the rest of this talk what I'm going to do is to describe this one successful construction of one successful and complete construction of a quantum theory of gravity uh, by Maldasena uh, about 20 years ago. So I will now describe the complete formulation presented by Maldasena of one model of quantum fluctuating space times. Okay? Now, in order to present this, 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 uh, his construction, it's first useful to recall how a much simpler problem was solved. Okay? And the simpler problem that I'm going to re recall for you is the construction of the quantum theory of the electromagnetic field. The, theory, con the construction of the quantum theory of quantum electrodynamics by Dirac, Feynman, Schwinger, Tomonaga, those guys. Okay. So this question was addressed between 1928 and 1950. And uh, the question was, can we find the quantum theory of an electron interacting with an electromagnetic field? or many electrons interacting with el electromagnetic field? And the answer was yes, though there were certain twists and turns, the answer was yes. And the answer has a name, it's called the, quant the theory of quantum electrodynamics. Now, uh, the construction of quantum electrodynamics was a great intellectual accomplishment and uh, required great ingenuity and many tricks involving, as many of you know, renormalization and infinities and so on. But if you take the long view, if you look at it from afar, uh, putting all those complications to one side, to look at the main conceptual ingredients, uh, the construction of electro, uh, quantum electrodynamics was extremely straightforward. You see, you started with classical electrodynamics which is a theory in which there are a finite number of cla a classical degrees of freedom in each point of space. And in the end, all you did to get quantum electrodynamics is take each of these classical degrees of freedom and promote them to quantum degrees of freedom, according to well understood correspondence rules, essentially enunciated by Dirac very early, early on in the study of, uh, of quantum mechanics. OK? The reduction from the classical quantum theory to the classical theory was guaranteed by this construction. Because the way you construct it guaranteed that in a, an appropriate limit, you'd recover classical physics. OK? All of this was, though it took a long time to get all the details straight, the basic conceptual idea between, behind the quantization of the electromagnetic field, the basic conceptual idea was very simple and a bit disappointing. It was a bit boring. You know, you understand classical electrodynamics, there's not that much more to the quantum theory, conceptually speaking, some details. OK, now I want to tell you about how it worked in this one model of quantum gravity that we understand. It'll be less boring. OK, I'm now going to try to describe the quantum theory of gravity 
actually, technically speaking, to be supergravity, a supersymmetric cousin of gravity. Unimportant, forget it. Quantum theory of gravity propagating on a 10 dimensional space, ADS5 plus S5. More correctly speaking, the quantum theory of gravity that at infinity reduces to the inf boundary of ADS5 plus S5. Okay, so the problem I'm posing myself is this. Look, we're, I just want to clarify. We're interested in the quantum theory of the real world. Okay, we don't know how to get there at the moment. So what we're going to do is to solve some toy problem. What, we're going to try to solve the problem of finding the quantum theory of gravity in one toy situation where we can answer the question. The toy situation is in a 10 dimensional world. Our world, as far as we can tell, at least in big scales, is not 10 dimensional. That's okay. We're not solving our world, we're solving a toy model. Okay? This, this, this world has a negative cosmological constant. Our world, as far as we can tell, has a positive cosmological constant. That's okay. We're not solving our world, we're solving a toy model. Okay? We've got this one quantum theory of gravity on this negative cosmological constant space, ADS5 plus S5, and uh, we want to find, this, this is the classical gravitational theory, we want to find the answer to the question, how do we quantize gravity, the, the, the gravitational theory living on the space? And Maldasena gave us an answer to this question. He said the answer to the quantization of gravity of gravitons propagating in this 10 dimensional space ADS5 plus S5 was given not by promoting each of the classical graviton excitations in this ADS5 plus S5 to a quantum excitation of gravitons uh, with some Dirac commutation relations. Not by that. But instead, the answer was given by a four dimensional non gravitational quantum field theory, which has a name. It's called UN. N equals 4, D equals 4, super Young Mills theory. This quantum field theory, in, some se in, in a sense that I will not make precise in this talk unless I'm asked, uh, lives at the boundary of ADS5 plus S5. Okay? So, what was the quantization of classical electrodynamics? Well, classical electrodynamics and classical degrees of freedom in each po point in, in a four dimensional space. And the quantization of classical electrodynamics is quantum electrodynamics, which had quantum degrees of freedom living at each point in a four-dimensional space. One quantum degree of freedom for every classical degree of freedom. Clean, simple correspondence. What was the, uh, what was the quantization of the theory of gravity living on ADS5 plus S5? Classical gravity on ADS5 plus S5 has classical degrees of freedom living on each point in ADS5 plus S5. Answer to the quantization is not quantum degrees of freedom living Co corresponding quantum degrees of freedom living on each point, ADS5 plus S5. Instead, very different thing, a four-dimensional, non-gravitational super angle theory based on a gauge group, you know, based on a gauge group which involves matrices of very large rank. Okay, now, what, I, I'm going to try to explain this a little more. UN n equals 4 d equals 4 super Young Mills is a theory of n cross n matrices. That's what the n in here tells you about. Okay? Tells you about the rank of the matrices. The fields in this theory are matrices, and n tells you about the rank of the matrices, the size of the matrices. Okay. Now, it's been known for a very long time, at least 40 years, that when you study quantum theories involving n cross n matrices, there is a limit of these quantum theories that becomes effectively classical as n goes to infinity. This is called the Toft limit, for those of you who are familiar with this. Okay? Uh, matrix models become effectively classical in, the in, a, in a particularly chosen large n limit. Okay? This, this is called the Toft limit. They become classical when expressed in terms of appropriate degrees of freedom, trace degrees of freedom. Okay? This has been known for a very long time. However, unlike the more trivial classical limit, the more trivial classical limit of h bar goes to zero, it's, this is the kind of knowledge of a mathematician, in the sense that it's like an existence theorem. In the large n limit, we know that the physics of the system, of these matrix models, becomes classical. But if you ask, ask me, but what is the classical system? I don't know. It's some classical theory. 
It exists, but I don't know what it is. OK, this is unlike the classical limit of h bar goes to 0 of a quantum system where you take a coupling constant goes to 0. You have a quantum theory, you take a coupling constant goes to 0, it becomes a classical theory whose classical dynamics you can immediately predict. OK, so this is an interesting point. There are two different ways that we know about, at least two different ways that we know about, of getting classical limits of quantum theories. One is to take h bar to 0, a coupling to 0. That's a simple, well understood way of getting a classical limit. That is the route that quantum electrodynamics employs to be quantized. It gives you a quantum theory which gets its, goes to the classical limit by taking the coupling constant to 0. That's why it was so easy to produce quantum electrodynamics. There is a second classical limit that we know about, one in which you, you take your fields to be matrices, or more generally, fields with a large number of degrees of freedom, take the number of degrees of freedom to infinity, OK, in an appropriate way. And that second way of getting classical limits, we've known for a long time, gives you a classical limit, but it's a much more interesting classical limit. And associated with the fact that it's an interesting classical limit, for interesting enough theories, we don't know what the classical limit is. We know it exists, but we don't know what it is. OK. Uh, in fact, the question of what is the classical limit of QCD in the large end limit is a question that has been addressed over the last 40 years by many people with very limited success. OK? Now, um, moreover, it was all, I think it was always, I think it was, you know, I think if you'd asked a physicist 20 years ago, what can you say, what, what, what do you anticipate about the classical limit of, let's say, QCD in the large end limit? You might have said, well, it's an interesting question, but, you know, likely that the answer is a mess. Some non local, crazy mess, so that even if you found the answer, the equations would be so complicated and so ugly that you wouldn't be able to learn anything from it. Maldesena in 1997 identified what the classical equations are for n equals 4 Yang Mills, this very supersymmetric cousin of four dimensional QCD in the large end limit. And he found that the effect that uh, the effective classical theory of these, of these theories is not a complicated, non local, unfamiliar mess that you can't say anything about but instead is given by the most beautiful equations of physics ever written down by human beings, in my opinion, uh, namely Einstein's equations of gravity. It's one of these remarkable, fact, uh, remarkable things that sometimes occur in the study of physics. You start studying a problem about, matric, um, about matrices. You take a large n limit of it, you identify the correct classical limit of, you identify the classical dynamics that governs that large n limit, and out pops out something that you never expected. Namely, Einstein's equations of gravity. OK. Now, I want to say a little more about, about the fundamentally surprising nature of this, 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 this discovery. You see, where did space time, ADS5 cross S5, Einstein gravity, and so on, come from the fundamental formulation of the theory? from the fundamental formulation of n equals 4, d equals 4, super Yang-Mills theory, the fundamental formulation of the theory had only four-dimensional space-time, non-gravitational, non-dynamical, no gravitons. You got Einstein gravity and 10-dimensional space-time and all of that from the large n limit. Okay, 10-dimensional space-time is an approximation that emerges in the large n limit. One by n corrections to this classical approximation lead to small quantum fluctuations of the space-time. The, quant the, the fluctuations of what you would call the quantize that you would get by semi classical quantization of gravity. Okay. However, once we take these fluctuations and sum them up at any finite value of n, that summation leaves you without any space time at all. All at any finite value of n, all you have is n equals 4, d equals 4 yang. Okay. Space time emerges as an approximation of the large n limit. Quantum fluctuations of that space time are the first indication that space time was an approximation. At finite n, all you're left with is a four dimensional field theory. 10 dimensional space and time and gravity have disappeared. They play no fundamental role in the formulation of the theory. Uh, someone who's poetically inclined might say space time was an illusion that evaporated away when you looked at finite n. 
in this particular model that we understand very well. Okay, so we've, uh, I've taken you through one successful quantization of a theory of gravity. The quantization of gravity in ADS 5 times S5 was given by a four dimensional quantum field theory. Quantization happened, classical limit emerged at infinite n. Quantization was going away from infinite n in a one over n expansion, finite n, that picture goes, you know, sort of starts evaporating. This suggests a completely unanticipated role for the theories of gravity. They emerge as the effect of classical description of strongly coupled non-gravitational systems, at least in some examples, in the limit of a large number of degrees of freedom. One by n corrections to the classical limit yield quantum fluctuations of gravity. Okay? This is another striking example of the unity of physics. You see, until 1997, if you had a physicist who was very interested in studying strongly coupled gauge theories, or strongly con coupled condensed matter systems of a certain sort, but was totally uninterested in, Einstein, uh, in, in gravitational phenomena, he would be certainly excused for completely ignore, you know, for not w wanting to study general relativity. After 1997, this becomes a slightly tenuous strat strategy, because it may be that you have no interest in gravity, but you're interested only in the study of strongly coupled gauge theories. Nonetheless, it may be that the best way to answer the question you are interested in, in the study of a strongly coupled gauge theory, at least if it's at large n, is by using Einstein's equations of gravity. Okay, so theories of quantum gravity provide an effective large n mean field description for several strongly coupled non-gravitational quantum systems. It seems likely that quantum gravity will, over the years, turn into an increasingly useful tool for studying all sorts of non-gravitational strongly coupled physics. Yeah. So the emergence of gravity in a completely, you know, the real, as we said in the first part of this talk, the real world has quantum field theories based on n cross n matrices, okay? The real world has gravity. But until 1997, I think these two things were thought of as separate things. They're not separate. They're in some sense secretly the same. It's one of these remarkable things that happens once in a while in the study of physics. Okay. This philosophy, the philosophy that uh, uh, gravity can be useful for, as a tool for understanding non-gravitational physics, is already being put to, you, to practical use. In the Rick experiment, the collision of lead or gold, nuclei, now also in the LHC experiments, uh, leads to the pr production of a, well, what is believed to be a strongly coupled quark gluon plasma. The subsequent evolution of the plasma is described by the equations of fluid dynamics. Gravitational results were used to motivate ball path values of viscosity to put into numerical simulations of the strongly interacting fluid. Gravity has also been used to elucidate the structure of the fluid expansion that should be employed for this purpose. There's a long story here about uh, um, Landau and Lifshitz Get, getting the most general expansion of hydrodynamics wrong. Okay. And their, their analysis 80 years after they made it, more or less followed by everyone since, in the study of first order, uh, first order corrected charge hydrodynamics was corrected once we managed to do a, appropriate calculations in Einstein-Maxwell gravity. Amazing, right? Okay. Uh, another example, well, there are many such examples, but well, this is a slightly random one. Uh, it proved useful for various questions in condensed matter physics, for studying entanglement entropies, for studying conductivities, frequency dependence of conductivities, and so on. Okay. Now, this is basically what I wanted to tell you. The rest of the slides are just wrapping up. Okay. So, I'm going to just describe now the... Uh, I'm going to describe the outlook for the future. Several aspects of the story I've outlined above remain unsatisfactorily understood. To start with, the fact that n equals 4, d equals 4, super angles theory reduces at the large n limit to classical type 2b supergravity has been established by studies within the string theory framework. Baldassena made his conjecture because string theory forced him to do it. If string theory was consistent, it implied this. However, N equals 4, D equals 4, super angles theory is a quantum field theory, which can be defined entirely independent of string theory. So since this is true, it should be possible just directly within the study of quantum field theory to establish that the large end limit of this quantum field theory is given by the equations of gravity. 
There have been many attempts to try to do this, but none has succeeded. So we lack a theoretical understanding of this fact. In other words, we do not understand in detail precisely how space-time and then retreating from the large end limit, fluctuating metrics emerge out of strongly coupled gauge dynamics. Um, it seems likely to me that in closing our gaps of understanding of this fact, we will learn many very important things. We know something is true. We know it's true because of the magic of string theory, but we don't understand in a hands-on way why it's true. Surely we have to fill that gap. Hey, and this, though it's been 20 years almost since Maldacena's conjecture, okay? 18, okay, maybe 18 years is more right. Okay, as we have seen, the exact formulation of quantum 2B supergravity on ADS5 cross S5 has already taught us a great deal. And not just about quantum gravity. Because it's also taught us about aspects of non-gravitational physics, for instance, concrete lessons in hydrodynamics. Okay, the string framework hosts several other natural and elementary theories. So, gravity in ADS5 cross S, in this asymptotically ADS5 cross S5 space, was a very natural theory to attack from the point of view of string theory because it was maximally supersymmetric. It arose in many natural contexts. Okay, but there are other many naturally, natural, very simple looking theories that arise in the study of string theory. One of which is, as a name, it's type two theory in flat 10 dimensional space. Uh, this is the first theory that any student of string theory studies. Very simple, right? Okay. We don't have a complete formulation of this theory. We don't know how to complete its asymptotic expansion into a full non perturbative expansion, unlike for ADS5 cross S5. Okay, so an obvious outstanding challenge to all string theorists is well, you have this wonderful formulation that identifies many quantum theories of gravity in an asymptotic expansion. Start finding non perturbative formulations of all of them, or at least of some of them, more than you've already done. An obvious outstanding challenge is to find logically complete formulations of all, at least some, and then eventually all of these other theories. I think it's likely that each success, when accomplished, will yield deep new insights of the nature of quantum space-time and make currently un unanticipated connections with diverse areas of theoretical physics and mathematics, making us realize that the, whole, the structures of human thought inspired by reality are even more interconnected than we thought. As I've described, the formulation of a single non-complete, non, uh, sorry, a single complete non-trivial quantum theory of gravity has been a non-trivial accomplishment. The string framework asserts the existence of many more theories. In order to, to address the question, questions of, the, of our universe though, we don't want to just go around finding more and more examples of complete theories of quantum gravity more and more toy models of quantum theories of gravity. We want to find, we would like a precise formulation of the quantum the theory of gravity that describes this, you know, the quantum theory of gravity in the world of our experience. Not just in any old toy model system. Does that quantum theory of gravity, the, gra the quantum theory that describes gravity of our universe, um, lie within the string framework? If so, where within the string framework? How do we find it? I do not know the answer to these questions, but I think it's likely that increased input from experiment will play a key role in resolving them somehow or the other. Um, in this connection, you see, this sounds a bit contradictory because I started this talk by telling you how experiment gives us very little guidance. How, how, how could this work? In this connection, some of what we've learned in the study of string theory is that the structure of quantum theories of gravity that quantum, the quantum theories of gravity appear to be more rigid in structure than you might have thought. You see, if you have a quantum field theory, you take a quantum field theory with a particular value of the mass of the electron, and then your experiment tells you the mass of the electron is a little bit different, no problem, you change the mass in your model. You have freedom in quantum field theories to tune parameters. Quant string theories, at least, uh, and likely other quantum theories of gravity, uh, are more rigid and arbitrary modifications, say, of the matter content or matter couplings in a quantum theory of gravity tends to lead to inconsistencies. For this reason, it may be possible to constrain the, the theory of space-time fluctuations of the real world, even by relatively low energy non-gravitational collider physics uh, experiments like LHC. It's a bit of a stretch, but maybe if you're clever enough. See, 
if a theory is very tightly connected, then maybe something here cannot be changed without changing something there. So measuring things here allows you to deduce what goes on there if you're clever enough. Um, there are, well, so let's try to learn all we can about, about, uh, about new physics, at least at the scales that we can access them. There are some indications that new structures and particle physics are waiting to be discovered at the TeV energy scale. The results of the LH LHC experiments, of the new run of the LHC experiment, uh, could provide, if they, if they see anything, okay, uh, could provide broad guidance in our search for the theory of quantum gravity. Uh, of course, LHC has discovered Higgs. Uh, but we're looking for something more. Um, Perhaps future non-collider experimental discoveries, example, for example, dark matter searches, the discovery of cosmic strings, CMB physics, so something like this bicep experiment that was so exciting but then evaporated. Something like that could also guide our search searches. Something like bicep two, if, if it holds up rather than evaporating, would be a great start here. Okay, so let's summarize. Quantum gravity is understood, a, a, a quantum, we don't have, you know, currently the, the framework of the theories of the real world of the sorts that I described are set within two broad frameworks today, the framework of quantum field theory and classical gravity, okay? There's no currently accepted uh, framework for quantum gravity within which the re real world theory of quantum gravity is situated. However, quantum gravity is needed to understand it's probably needed to understand the early universe. String theory is an exciting but incompletely understood framework that can be used to build quantum theories of gravity, though we're not sure whether our theory, our, the quantum theory of, of our universe lies within this framework. But at least many toy models we can build and we can understand. One or a few toy models have been understood in full detail, non perturbatively And uh, understanding these, uh, these toy models has led to a complete but very surprising formulation of the non-perturbative physics of a class of 10-dimensional quantum gravity systems. The non-perturbative description is given in terms of lower dimensional non-gravitational quantum systems based on theories with large matrices. This has led to a surprising new role, new practical application for the study of quantum gravity uh, classical gravity and then its quantum fluctuations emerge in the mean field uh, description of strongly coupled non-gravitational dynamics. The complete formulation of other, gra other gravitational systems that we know from string theory exist is an outstanding formal challenge which I think is very important if we can make any progress there. And with luck, ex upcoming experiments may provide guidance for the formulation and discovery of the theory that governs space-time fluctuations, not just in toy models, but in the real world. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Shiraz. Uh, I think we have time for a few questions. Is there any? So you said that uh, uh, dynamical nature of space-time is an experimentally proven fact. Uh, so uh, I mean, uh, we know that Einstein's GR holds uh, because it produces the phenomenological result that is experimentally proved. So I mean, in principle, it may possible that uh, we can reproduce the same results with some non-geometric theory of gravity. I mean, is there any direct experimental proof that space-time is dynamic? So, uh, how, how direct would you like it to be? I mean, well, for instance, if you discover gravity waves, would you consider that direct experiment? No, that is still not discovered. It's not discovered, but I, I just want to learn your standards. Uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, would, would that qualify as direct for you? I yes. mean, there's so many experiment, you know, if a theory makes a zillion predictions and all of them turn out right, you tend to believe this, you know, what's that thing that if it looks like a rabbit and smells like a rabbit and tastes like a rabbit, it's probably a rabbit, you know. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, I, I, basically, I, I, there have been a hundred years of successful predictions of general relativity uh, and would have to be a conspiracy theory 
for some other theory to match it. But, 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 but it was a serious question. If they discover gravitational radiation, would you consider that direct proof? Yeah, most probably, yes. Okay, so I think very likely in 10 years you'll have your direct. Yeah. Your direct. And, and another question is, uh, uh, you said that uh, in large, uh, strongly coupled f um, field theories, uh, in large end limit, uh, their classical limit is uh, uh, Einstein's gravity is in AD ADS. Five times this. Five place. So, I mean, uh, Class a classical th a, th a theory should I mean th that is a gravity theory on a particular space time. So right. I mean, let me say it more precisely. You see, uh, it almost uh, you're right and you yeah. I mean, uh, the Einstein's theory is a theory in in general. I mean, in gen any space time. So yes. So uh, part of uh, part of your question is the following. In Einstein's theory of gravity, the geometry of space-time is a dynamical variable. So it sounds almost like a contradiction to say gravity on ADS-5 process 5, because geometry should be moving, what do you mean, on a particular space? Uh, I tried in one of my sentences to make that more precise, but let me do it better now. You see, in a dynamical, in, a cla in many classical theories, certainly in Einstein gravity, okay, um, while space times can fluctuate, it's often the case that they cannot fluctuate at infinity. Because fluctuation of a space time at infinity can involve infinite energy changes or infinite action changes. So what the precise statement is that what we're looking for is a gravity theory of all those metrics which at infinity reduce to the asymptotics of ADS-5 process time. Okay? That's the precise statement. Thanks. So, can you hear me? Yeah. I can hear. The, the, uh, the recent work by Nima, Kakazo, and that they're, they're also studying N equals four uh, Yangmills and yes. they discovered re like a lot of structures. Is that an <coughs> relevant to like what? Like, do you have any comments on that? Yeah. Uh, so I presume you're talking about the study of scattering amplitude. Uh, amplitude you had drawn. And so of scattering amplitudes in, uh, in ADS-5 process 5. Um, yeah, you know, it's, I'm sure it's connected in some way. Nima and company view this, view S matrices as a holographic formulation of ordinary quantum field theories. That is a, okay, uh, that's a bit different from what I've been talking about and we, one could debate about that. But, I don't have anything particular to say. I don't. I mean, I don't really know how that that that, that story feeds into any of what we're talking about. Yeah, I don't have anything. Better. Of course, that makes connections, right? Because at very strong coupling, you get results that come out of gravity. For instance, you make connection to alde maldasena calculations and so on. So I'm sure there are connections, but I don't know. Uh, you said that 1 over n fluctuations reduces the, uh, the dimensions of the space-time uh, uh, starting from the gravity side. So why is it reduced to 4 in this case? Uh, do we know? Why not 9? Why not 9? You see, it's a great question. We have many different examples of this. I talked about the best understood example of this phenomenon. But we have examples of reductions from 11 to 3. Okay. We have examples of reductions from 10 or 11 to 1. So I wish we knew. I, we don't, I don't know well enough. You see, how we learn of all of this is from string theory. The way we learn about this. How, we did, how did Malda say and I discover the carbon? There are these solitonic objects in string theory, which, have, which string theory tells you has two different kinds of descriptions. One in terms of what are called closed strings, which gives you the gravitational description. One in terms of what are called open strings, which gives you the gauge theory description. And string theory asserts that in particular limits, these two descriptions should just agree, even though they look very different. And when we, stu when we study the consequences on that string theory, some of these solitons are one-dimensional solitons, which gives you a one-dimensional field theory. Some of these solitons are um, three-dimensional or four-dimensional solitons, like these, these n equals four angles arose because it arose in a solitonic, the, as open string description of solitonic uh, um, excitation of 2B theory called D3 brains. 
That's where this three came from. That's how we know. But if your question is fundamentally, how do you know? You know, how do you know? Starting from the gravity theory, what you'll get to, or starting from the field theory, what we don't understand it well enough to know. Sorry, I, I don't know. That's part of understanding how space-time emerges from these theories. I could say some things about it. Um, all of these theories, like for instance, n equals four angles theory. Um, all of these theories have at least one extra dimension. Okay, but then there are additional things. Now, you know. How you might have guessed that an S5 is going to emerge in the geometry is from the fact that there is an SO6 global symmetry in n equals 4 angle theory. SO6 global symmetry has to be re realized geometrically, and the way it's realized is as the isometric group of an S5. And that's, you know, there's certainly a tight connection between the symmetry group and the internal manifolds. So you can say some things about it, especially a posteriori, but it's hard to say. Uh, and how, how, how do you know that, you know, where did the four dimensions come from, from that symmetry analysis point of view? It comes from the fact that ADS5 has an isometric group that is SO42. Uh, SO42 happens to be the same as the conformal group of a four dimension theory. N equals four angles is a conformal field theory, so that its conformal algebra gets encoded in the symmetry algebra of ADS. So, uh, you know, now that you know the answer, you can find connections. So that level, you could talk about it, but in some fundamental deep way, how constructively does it, I don't know. So as you pointed out, the uh, Einstein theory of uh, gravity, it is a local theory. That means the, all the interaction, it is local. On the other hand, uh, in quantum theory, we, saw, we found that there exist particle which are entangled and which exhibits non-local correlation. That means this correlation don't have any local interpretation. Do mm. you think this is one of the main problem to construct this? No, I don't uh, think so. You see, uh, you can have a theory whose dynamics is local, whose Schrodinger type equations are local, and yet you can have non-trivial correlations in states. That, as you say, is understood. It sounds spooky, but it's understood more or less. I don't think those two play with it. What? Uh, the role of supersymmetry in this context. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Particularly n is equal to 4, beta function is 0, finite theory, simple yes. as possible. You see, good. So, yeah, so in this, this particular toy model was very highly supersymmetric. Let me count for the, num the number of supersymmetries for you. n equals 4 theory has 16 ordinary supersymmetries, but as you said, it's a 0 beta function, and therefore superconformal. And so it turns out I have 16 other supersymmetries, the conformal analogs of supersymmetries, 32 supercharges. Type 2B supersymmetry on ADS5 cross S5 also has 32 supercharges. Okay. Uh, as far as we can tell, it's the highest number of supersymmetries that theory, of gra uh, theory can exist without necessarily having um, higher than spin 2 particles. Okay, so it's very, very supersymmetric. Okay. Now, what was the role of supersymmetry? <laughs> supersymmetry was very important in order for us to have a controlled description that string theory would then assert has two different descriptions, both of which you can control and give rise to a controlled conjecture. Okay? So it is very important for, for having a controlled description, such a toy model. However, once you have this description, you can now break supersymmetry. Okay? So for instance, you can ask, once you know n equals four angles, so, so what is the field content of n equals four angles? It's um, gauge bosons, scalars, and fermions. Now, if you just by hand add masses to the scalars and fermions, at low energies, all you're left with is gauge bosons. And that would be then pure non supersymmetric angles here. Now you can ask within ADS CFT, do we know the rules that allow us to change the Lagrangian by changing the uh, couplings for for operators, adding a new operator. We do, okay. So you could start trying to change the theory once you know the dual form by turning on masses for these scalars. Okay. Of course, people have tried to do this, and you run into the following problem. I mean, so such a description exists, we believe. Okay, some bulk description exists, but you see, the true description of the bulk is in terms of string theory. There's a certain limit at which string theory reduces just to plain gravity without all the other, or other fields of string theory. In the process of turning on these, these masses, 
you leave that regime. So the bulk dual description which we believe exists, which will be dual to pure non supersymmetric Young Mills theory, will presumably be not just gravity, but a string theory. Gravity interacting with all the other stringy states. That's presumably why it's been so hard to find. Okay. So supersymmetry, so far as we can, that my first case is it, it's important to give you very simple examples where you can decouple scales and so on. Harder to do that without supersymmetry. But we do believe that the basic phenomenon exists without supersymmetry. We think we know, we almost have a, a construction of it, except we can't carry that through in detail. 